So thanks for coming. Um, my name is Christian. I'm presenting some work we did on uh, protecting database databases uh, with some tactical analysis analysis of SQL commands. Um, so that's called protecting databases with trees. This doesn't work. So. Um, my primary profession is I'm a researcher at, a f at the Arti Artificial Intelligence Group of the University of Dortmund. And basically I'm studying uh, the use of machine learning methods and artificial intelligence methods like data mining methods for um, machine learning, uh, for web security. Um, as a hobby, I'm developer of several projects, um, all affiliated with the Mod Security, with the Mod Security Web Application Firewall. So I have some um, stuff on my web page, jwall.org, which is uh, some log file aggregation management stuff and some um, web application policy compiler and so on. And this is what I do in my spare time. So uh, this talk is not touching anything of that. Uh, this talk is about uh, first some the threat of SQL injections. Is that st still a valid threat? Then uh, I'll try to give a picture on where we can find fight SQL injections, and then I will start uh, diving into how we thought um, SQL injections might be fought at a good place. So I'd like to start this talk like uh, every good SQL injection talk. And every good SQL injection talk probably starts with this. And <laughs> I guess, who does not know this? this? OK, at least one. <laughs> Um, so basically, it's just a student typing in his uh, his um, student name, and he types in Robert Atherstone job table students, and that gets into inserted into the database, or in, it gets into inserted, unvalidated, into the web application. It finally hits the database, and it inserts some record and drops all the other records as well. So um, this cartoon is about five years old. And if you just attended the other talk beforehand, you'll n you notice that SQL injection is about th 13 years old. So it's pretty amazing that, uh, so the first question I would, which arise to me was, is it still a valid research topic? So is it really necessary to focus on SQL injections? This was uh, the web hacking incident database, which is a record of, uh, of all web hacking a incidents which uh, have been becoming public, and this is just um, the first half of June this year. So uh, there was this Sony breach, um, Sony Europe breach, some DOS attacks, um, an F FBI website was hacked, and some more stuff. And if you look at the types of attacks, then there's a lot of SQL injections involved in that. And if you just... Uh, display that, then there's almost half of the attacks which have been carried out against uh, web applications have been SQL injections. Most of them are just easy, and is uh, they are especially easily to be automated with uh, a lot of tools. Imperva has a, um, a trend report um, they give away every month, I guess, and there was uh, one, which is number four, which in which they monitored like 30 web applications. And they were just checking how, what, is, what, what kind of attacks are, have been raised against these. So they found out there's like 71 SQL injection attempts on average per hour. They have like 800 to 1,300 injection attempts at peak times. And most of these have been uh, carried out by highly automated injection tools like SQL Map, uh, SQL Map or Heavey. Uh, has anyone experienced with SQL Map? So, uh, and the others, have the others ever heard of SQL Map? Who, is not, who has not ever heard of SQL Map? So, this is quite a nice, nice um, tool by Bernardo Namele and some other guy. And it gives you, it just checks your web application for uh, injectable parameters. And once it found something, it gives you a complete shell of your, your, your web, uh, web uh, uh, of your database through the web application. It does encoding, it does tempering, and does try to um, avoid detection by numerous um, me mechanisms, and it's pretty good. So another um, trend report was about the um, topics of 
hacking forums, so they just checked on online forums how d uh, uh, about what type of types of attacks do hackers discuss. And you see again that SQL injections, that the yellow one is almost 20%. Uh, then uh, when, I w when I entered this conference, I checked my Twitter account and uh, I just use uh, Twitter as a good source for f uh, getting notifies of new attacks. And this is what I've just found uh, yesterday. And uh, that's a week old. So um, there was a SQL injection in, s in a C, c -sharp, um, environment. And um, there was some, the story about behind this is about some developers who just have a, who just coded the C, um, c -sharp page. And some, some of their stuff didn't work. So they found a flag which says um, validate equals true or false. And they just turned off the uh, input validation with that. Um, and then their code worked, so they were happy. <laughs> and this is the result. So um, if you just have a look at the top 10, um, OVAS top 10 list, then SQL injection is on, on that list for a long time. And uh, also if you look at other institutes which um, compile such lists, then it's like uh, this is the Sun's Mitra top 25 programming errors. So there's also the n improper n neutralization of SQL elements is just a high impact topic. Guess what? It doesn't always have hit web applications. So um, this is Android, and um, data is stored, uh, any data is stored in databases, also SMS. So there was a SQL injection in an SMS gateway, so you could just use your mobile phone to inject SQL commands into the database of your SMS gateway system. So it does not only affect SQL injection. So what makes up SQL injection? Basically, um, what we have is this situation. I guess this is what most of you guys have at home or at, at work. So we have some web server which is serving URLs. And uh, once in a while, there are some URLs, your, um, web requests hitting your database, uh, hitting your web server, and your applic application is somehow create, uh, executing a SQL command back to the uh, back on the da back end database, produces some results, and delivers that to the client. So the question is now, what makes up a SQL injection? Basically, there's two things involved. First, the attacker has to insert some payload, some SQL payload into the web application, okay? So this has to be inserted somewhere here, and ma it has to reach somewhere into the web, web application logic. And the second um, condition we need to have is we need to have this SQL inject, uh, is this in injection piece have to alter or modify the, uh, the SQL statement that is to be executed. So. <coughs> if we just insert some union select login password from users, and if we do this, this correctly and uh, the web application is vulnerable to SQL injections, then the database statement is not only select title and abstract from docs, but it's a union of the first select and the result of the, su the, uh, the second select statement. So this is basically the, ba um, the core idea of uh, SQL injections. So where can we find, or where can we fight SQL injections? And if you attended the last talk, then you should be aware that the first step you have to do is you have to check, fight web um, SQL injections within your web application f uh, code. So if you have any chance to access that code, and if you have some, um, you like, you didn't outsource your application, but you write your application yourself, then this is the first step you need to take. The second one, which is usu usually done, is which is within the HTTP traffic. So you employ like a web application firewall, intrusion detection system, or something like that. This, these are all in front of your web, web server or in front of your web application. And these check for known um, SQL injections. And the last part we can do is, and this is what, we, uh, what I will focus on in the, on the second half of the talk is uh, we can fight a, a SQL injections within the executed XML code. So this is the, th the third uh, location where we can 
fight. Having a look at the first one is, uh, so they're pretty good um, guides for like code review and um, do train your developers, raise awareness of SQL, uh, of the danger of SQL injections and stuff like this in within your development team, do penetration testing, <laughs> do risk, uh, risk management. Okay, uh, we just heard, forget about risk management on <laughs> the other talk, but uh, still that's uh, one, one of the approaches uh, which are recommended, but this is just the best thing to do in the first place. So what we can do here is we can use prepared statements. Prepared statements has have been around for quite some time, and there are prepared statements for like almost every language. And what they do is you don't directly um, insert user input in anymore into the SQL string you want to execute. What you do is you give that template string to the prepared uh, statement, and then make the database driver escape all the special characters so there's a safe and a safe um, container so that the, the attacker cannot break out of the statement. This is good, and I, I believe that almost, if you don't hit a bug in, in your database driver, then you will be probably almost 100% sure about SQL injections by just using prepared statements. However, <laughs> you can also do wrong with, SQL, uh, with prepared statements. So if you just use prepared statements and concatenate the uh, user input into the prepared statement, then you don't have any benefit of that. So this is about developer training. And so I will, I will just, just close this, have a look at the code section now. And now we moved on to some different part, which is intrusion detection and prevention. And this is my favorite uh, site of Dam Damiano Balzoni of the focus ideas mailing list, and this says just all this stuff about intrusion detection and intrusion prevention is just a big attempt to ba patch bug systems. So in the first place, we need to have a patch for the system itself, for the application. And this, w but everything we do now is just a helpless, uh, uh, like uh, crying for help, maybe. So um, what do intrusion detec detection systems do? Some, um, some things like uh, PHP IDS or Snort or web application firewalls like Mod Security and some uh, vendor specific stuff um, have been promoted to check the web traffic against which hits your web application. And basically um, what they do is they check for keywords of SQL commands. So they check the user inputs and just ask themselves, is there I have a list of known SQL injections or known SQL keywords, and is there any of that keywords in my user data? And this is um, like a pattern, pattern matching approach, and this is employed by almost all web application firewalls and ID intrusion detection systems, like the mod security core rules, the IBM web application firewall, Imperva, Imperva Secure Sphere, and some others. So this is basically the, the, the approach they do. And it's not just, just keywords. Most of the time, it's complex regular expressions. So this is a regular expression of a mod security rule, which helps you find SQL injections in your input. Now, corresponding to that is an email on the mailing list asking, OK, I have a trigger of that regular expression against that token. So that was some cookie. And uh, basically, the regular expression just found this two characters, or. Woo! That's a false alert. So uh, it's really hard to, to, uh, to write good rules. So, and you have, to, you have to take care of a lot of things, and we'll see in a minute. So um, some of the web application firewalls try to replace known keywords. For instance, the following one would prob this one would probably end up as a database error. So if the web, w once the web application starts removing a keyword, we end up with a much finer statement. And this is a valid SQL statement. And if, you're, if your application is, uh, is prone to uh, SQL injection, that will, hit the that will hit the database. There are some um, great articles. Uh, one is a presentation by Johannes Dase from the uh, Ruhr University of Bochum, which is somewhere near my place. And there's another white paper from the CWH Underground, 
crew, um, they just send out a list of how to evade detection of intrusion detection and p uh, web application firewalls. That can be done by encoding, by obfuscation, or by HTTP parameter um, pollution. And I'll give examples for that in a minute. So, easiest thing is some, uh, some web application fi firewall just didn't do double URL encoding. So they just used the data and just URL decode, decode date, the, the data once. And if you just do this, then you will end up with this. And if your web application itself does double URL encoding, then the, then the application will be hit by this. And this, again, is a valid SQL that can, be hit your data, hit, can hit your database. So that is very easy, and I guess most of, most of the WAF um, vendors have fixed that problem. So what about other encoding stuff? What about base64 encoding? So if you run an ASP application, there's some variable I was aware of. It's called view, view state, and it's somehow, st uh, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not an ASP programmer, but uh, view state is just some variable for keeping the client state. And you can also, and this one is base64 base encoded and changed between the client and the server. So now you end up with this. How should your web application firewall be aware of that? So it ha you have to configure your web application to actually decode the stuff in the right decoding. Because if you decode that, then you have, for instance, a variable so, um, something like or one greater than zero. This may return, for instance, more data records than you want to expose to the user. Then there's comments. My, for instance, MySQL, uh, MySQL allows f f uh, numerous um, different types of comments. For instance, from the hashtag, until, uh, from the hash character until the end of the line, from the minus minus until the end of the line, C style comments, and some others. And you can try to obfuscate your injection payload by using comments. This, for instance, is a completely validated by a um, SQL command for MySQL. Now, um, this one is um, one of the examples of, the Johann of Johannes Dase to evade detection of a mod security core, core rule set. And if you just decode it, then this is a mixture of, um, of a um, hashtag until the uh, hash character until the end of the line comment mixed with a C style comment, which has no effect because MySQL is just ignoring everything after that, and so on. So you try to obfuscate the SQL command in a way that the patterns of your web application firewall or, of, or your intrusion detection don't catch that anymore. Then you have MySQL special comments, which have special syntax with an exclamation mark just for running specific code only on specific versions of your MySQL database. And this can be used for probing the MySQL version you're trying to attack and so on. And there's a bunch of that to um, evade mod security core rules and a WAPL web application firewalls. That's a co commercial one. And um, so this is basic. This is pretty basic, or one equals one. So um, it's pretty basic to just use a, a always true condition into in, and inject that into your um, SQL command to return more records than you are about to al uh, allow to see. And one thing you could do is, if you just start with or one equal uh, one greater zero or one equals one, you can start obfuscating that. So. 2 times 3 is greater than 4. That's a true statement. You can use mod MySQL, MySQL variables to check. You can s just use MySQL auto-typing. So this is a 1. This is automatically typed to um, convert it to true or auto-casting. This is casted to true. And you can run any type of mathematical functions. So if you round P by 1 and add like 2, uh, to that, then you end up with five, and this e um, almost f for sure equals your ma major version of uh, MySQL database. So this is a neat trick to just evade pattern detection. Another thing which is really cool is 
if you just specify a single parameter more than once to your web, web application, then typically different web applications will behave different. For instance, in PHP Apache, um, you will just ret return the first parameter, okay? This is what I would have expected and what people, most of people would have expected. If you run ASP.NET on IIS, then the parameters val parameter values get concatenated with a comma. And this is pretty handy because if you start this and you have a, uh, you're running ASP um, web application and you just, for just for safety, start to set up mod security in front of that, then this will be the view of mod security, okay? You can just start um, start throwing your patterns in that at that and maybe you just don't catch that and it ends up in your database uh, in your uh, web application backend concatenated with comma so it's a neat and perfectly fine SQL command inject which is not really visible there so this is an easy example but you can obfuscate all that with uh, with commas as with comments as well so just start an open opening comment here and a closing comment here, and this gets con uh, concatenated, and you can try to uh, to evade your web application firewall. This is um, um, idea is called parameter pollution, and this has been successfully used not only to evade mod security but also to evade the IBM web application firewall and impair the um, secure sphere. So my point here was just to emphasize there's a lot of things you can do to get around detection of patterns. And this is just uh, um, obfuscating. So the big question is how to evade the evasion. So we cannot just use plain patterns anymore. We need to have a, a way to um, somehow um, see the data in a plain way, in a normalized way. And we do this by moving the uh, to a different perspective. So we talked about the code security. We talked about intrusion detection at the HTTP traffic. And now we're moving to the database. And there's some benefits we get from, from this point of detection. First, any encodings which have been used by the attacker have been decoded by the application in the way that, the, uh, that you programmed your application. So second, there's no more mangling done. So the, data, the database statement that arrives at this place is not, um, is not modified anymore. There's an exception for that. So it's internally modified by the, sequ the qu query optimizer of your database. But we, this, we can just ignore that for a moment. And the fact is that any encode, any of the attacks I, pre I presented like any of the coding attacks, don't work at this lever level. So you're free. You can the uh, attacker can just use tons of encoding stuff and encoding tricks, and it won't trick the detection anymore because it doesn't apply here. So recall what an, a SQL injection is made of. So the SQL injection needs to modify the existing statement, and the modified statement needs to be valid SQL code. There are some, it do doesn't have to. Some, sometimes attackers can also get gain information from uh, database errors. So it doesn't always have to be valid SQL code, but we just uh, stick to that for a moment. So in this case, we have select title and abstract where text like drop table students. So is that a valid SQL in injection? And I'd like to ask you, <laughs> because we had this discussion yesterday. So is, would that be a SQL injection or not? Okay, and if that's a free text field, then that's a valid statement, right? So it's it's a um, legal statement, and this one would be, okay? So this one would be, it uh, meets all conditions, it's get, it has some SQL, uh, SQL commands injected, this is, that's the union select, and it has altered or modified the structure of the SQL statement. And the thing we were, I was thinking about, is how can we capture these modifications? So um, in theory, <laughs> SQL is a highly structured language. 
So uh, SQL statements can be passed into an abstract syntax tree. This is what the database does. And um, the abstract syntax tree is a, re um, a nice representation or normalized representation of your SQL command. So if you have a look at that, this is some statement. And this is the abstract syntax tree. This is like an ideal idealized one, so there's some, some more. If you just have a look at the database itself, then there's some more um, stuff um, attached to each node. But we start with a select node, then we have a from list, and uh, the from list just references a table, which is docs. Then we have a result column list, which is title and abstract. So these are resu result columns, and these have like two columns, or column references, and these are referencing some column names. And then we have a where clause, and the where clause is also in a tree structure. So with that in mind, we have a look now at, so we have this kind of structure for SQL injection, and uh, for normal SQL command, and now we want to have the effect of a SQL injection regarding that tree. So basically, if you just take that one, then the attacker is basically, and that's the goal of the attacker, is adding a lot of nodes to our tree, right? So um, we start up with all the green one, and all the red one is all the stuff that is added to the statement in the tree, uh, or to the tree of the statement. It can be two trees as well. If we have a look at the little bobby tables uh, from the very beginning of the cartoon, and there's a just a semicolon starting a new table, uh, a new command. So we have some legal statement with probably some invalid uh, values, and we have a completely uh, different and completely disjoint new tree. And there has been some work on that um, by Gregory Burer and others, and what they did was uh, pass tree validation to prevent SQL injections. So they um, they did notice that such a, such uh, that the injected snippets changed the overall structure of the query of the query tree. And what they did is what they tried to compare the different trees before and after the insertion of user user data input. And they had some implementation called SQL Guard. I have a, had a look at that. I had, I had a look at that, but uh, it didn't work out for me. And the m worst downside of this is it needs a change of the application code to use that uh, before and after insertion of the user input of your SQL statement. And here I do have a gem for you. If you need to change the database, uh, your application code, for God's sake, forget about this and stick to prepared statements. This is my first rule number one, which we had in the beginning. The best place to fight SQL injections is to secure your code. So if you have to touch any, any, every place where you are using SQL commands, then just use the correct way of using prepared statements, and you're probably safe, more safer than using that solution. So back to the, t back to the trees. What, cha what properties of the trees can we monitor to uh, detect any structural changes. So we have like two trees. The left one is the regular one, and the right one is the injected one, okay? And so we can, for instance, have a look at the number of inner, inner tree nodes. All the blue nodes are inner tree nodes, and on the left hand, we have nine inner, inner nodes. On the right hand, we have 15. We can have a look at the leaf nodes. On the left hand, we have six leaf nodes. On the right hand, we have 10. And, of course, we also can use the height of the tree. So we have four versus five. And now we check how does this scale to all the obfuscation an attacker might do um, if he wants to uh, evade detection in, 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 the, in the first front layer, like in uh, uh, pattern detection. So uh, an attacker might just replace this SQL um, or one equals one, this always true statement, and tries to obfusc obfuscate this by uh, using round p and round pi and that's that kind of stuff. So what this ends up in is this statement all alone just creates a new tree. And just imagine this is 
one, two, three, four, five, six inner nodes just added by this obfuscation. So in this way, the more the attacker tries to obfuscate, the more he changes the tree. So just imagine, this is an always true statement, just imagine how big, how large the tree is for that injection. And this is uh, just a subtree of the one where it's inserted. So um, it's not like 5 to 6 anymore, it's like 5 to 65 or something. And the question we asked was, how can we use this to somehow um, detect attacks in our, uh, in our application? So we started off with a very simple Java web application. And um, because I didn't have access to any production systems which allowed me to uh, access the database log files. And so I, I needed to have some sort of proof environment. So what I used is um, I used a MySQL backend. A hi it's highly vulnerable to uh, SQL injections, and it allows, uh, allows to specify a, a small, simple mapping of URLs to SQL, ma so SQL commands. Along with that, I can access th um, this web shop and log all the statements and have a nice da data aggreg aggregated. So this is how it looks like. This is the typical setup. You have some URLs, and these are mapped to SQL statements. And then you can call all these URLs, and you're, cre you're creating some sort of a basic a baseline of your shop, and shop and how it's used. So we generated some normal workload, and then we attacked the shop with C SQL map just to see how the difference is. So we ended up with about 6,000 um, legal, uh, 6,200 6, uh, SQL um, commands, and 150, about 150 of them have been SQL, um, SQL injections using the SQL map attack tool. And now if you look at uh, the distribution of the number of inner nodes versus the number of total no nodes, yeah, total nodes, then you'll see this blue dot is the single statement in an un not injected way. So as soon as we start injecting, or SQL map starts injecting, the SQL statement is modified, and it's spreading all over just because it has more nodes in it. Okay, there's a special um, special one which is which has like 200 nodes over here, and this is just all the statements which did not validate against the parser. So these can be just easily attacked because they're just not valid SQL co uh, SQL commands. Okay. And to make that a little bit more visual, I just added some jitter because the small dot on the lower end is not just one dot, it's just a lot of dots. So we added some random jitter. So from a machine learning point of view now, what, you would, what would you do? You would want to just cut off all the attacks. And this is what we did with some magic. So what we would like to have is a some sort of binary classifier, so some function, a linear function, which just decides whether the good, um, wh whether a statement is on the left, uh, on the left-hand side, on the, on the on the good side, or on the bad side, just using this uh, node count. So this is what we basic, what my primary primary job is at artificial intelligence department. So we're looking for simple basic ba binary classifier comparable to a knife base or something like this, which you use for tagging your um, spam mails. And we split up all the recorded data we in into one training data, a training data set and a test set. On the training data set, we just trained a classifier. And then on the test set, we used the classifier to test whether this is good for detection or not. And it turned out that it didn't work very well in the first step. So um, what you see here is this is the number of real, um, this is the real reality, and this is, uh, and um, this is the prediction. So from all normal normal queries, all normal queries have re have been correctly identified. Okay, so we have no false positives. But there have been like 21 queries which have been s uh, sent out by SQL map which didn't have been classified as normal traffic. So that would, would be like 21 missed attacks and this is not what you want, right? So we're fine with that, but there's work to be done on that side. 
So we had a look at this. And in the first experiment we, we ran, it was like we were using um, the user agent field of SQL map just to identify attacks and, and normal, normal queries. And it turns out that SQL map, map also sends normal queries just for probing the application, just for fr figuring out wh which is a dynamic parameter and which or which parameter um, changes the, uh, the results, th just to check which parameter can be injected. So um, we, we went, went through all these 21 manually, and uh, they were all clean statements. So there's just not an attack. We created another, um, a second data set. And this time, we had like um, uh, 1,200 um, statements or queries. And all of them were perfectly be sep uh, have been perfectly separated just by counting the number of nodes. Just a note here, and this is just observing a single statement. So it w that was just more of a proof of concept is, can we, for one statement, can we de um, just detect attractions or modifications of that statement just by using two, p two features, the tree node, uh, the node count, the inner node count, and the total node count. So this works for single URL, but who does run a uh, web application of you uh, with a single URL? Nobody? I'm surprised. <laughs> so what happens if we just use the same setup for all, s for all queries? So um, we just used <coughs> all two, uh, 6,251 queries, and um, we wa wanted to have them classified with a classifier. <coughs> and it turned out it didn't work. So there's just too few information in just using the tree, tree count, uh, the tree node count. So um, if you just paint that, then you see that um, there's some red ones which are modifications of these, which, which are interleaved with other legal statements. So um, just using these two axes is not enough for classification. But we have the power of trees. So, um, so far we just knew you uh, used the height and the number of nodes in a tree. And, but we can do some more. <coughs> For instance, if we use this tree of a SQL command, then this is the uh, syntax tree and we can derive all the, the edges of the tree. For instance, we start with some I imaginary select uh, start, start node and um, start is derived to select, select is derived to result column list, uh, yeah, to result column list, to from list, to where clause. And we can use all these edges. And, um, we can, and th that way we can map the tree into a high dimensional feature vector, you know, to a vector space. So we just, for each statement, we created the, the pass tree, and then we just counted how many, how many uh, edges do pass trees have in common. And this ends up in a high dimensional tree. And again, this is the same concept you use in your you everyday use in your um, spam detection mechanism. So this is just sort of word a, a word vector presentation. And it turned out it worked pretty well. So we just ended up with almost all six thousand uh, statements being v perfectly classified. So we're still missing eleven attacks. That's bad, especially since they're attacks. So um, that's just the learning um, algorithm we used. So we just had a look at what went wrong. So this was one of the attacks which have been automatically labeled as attack by SQL map, so just by the user agent. And you would agree to me that this is a valid statement, right? So it was just not an error by the statement, by, uh, by the classifier. It was ju just incorrectly labeled by me as an attack. It's just a probe of a query, so you don't want to have that as a reported reported as as um, attack. So the classifier was right. This is another one, and you see um, it looks like attack and um, like an attack. And most almost every web application firewall would have complained it it's, it is a, an attack, but in fact it doesn't al alter the statement because it doesn't break out of a uh, break out of the string. Um, apostrophe, right? So that's not an attack, it's a legal query. 
So once we corrected the, the errors um, statements, we reran the experiment and it showed up that with a high dimensional vector space, we could perfectly separate all the attacks from the normal queries. As a classifier, we used to support vector machine and this is like uh, details about the uh, algorithm. So what about a real application? And this is a good question. So the, the question, the application we tested this on was like a demo application and uh, it's sort of very small. If you have any interest in validating this on your product, uh, just send me your database log file and I will be happy to have a look. <laughs> Probably you won't. <laughs> yeah, I it's, it's hard to get a, a productive uh, environment to test this on, but uh, what we did is uh, we checked out TYPO3. Everybody, a anyone using TYPO3? So um, that's a content management system which highly um, relies on uh, SQL queries. And basically, TYPO3 does use the d MySQL database for everything, for caching, for like everything. And um, we had like two uh, 1,000 queries of um, in TYPO3, and we just changed these queries um, in manually to create like 15 artificial attacks. And about 90% of those have been detected perfectly. Uh, but there are still like 10% missing. And our impression is that this is just because we had 1,000 queries, which have been created in, the log fi in a log file, but, uh, but uh, TYPO3 itself is using like 500 different types of queries. So um, it's, really it's really hard to distinguish between all these queries ju with just that small amount of training data. So um, what we tried to do was, we tried to use, um, to still use, um, or I get an, somehow an, Im an impression on how this relates to uh, TYPO3 uh, as well. So um, what we used was, um, we tried to get a visu visualization of your database use. So this is TYPO3. You haven't, I guess you never had a look at TYPO3 this way. <laughs> Basically, this is uh, the algorithm behind this graph is just it um, uses the, C uh, the, um, tree, the query tree to compare the difference between queries and just try starts grouping d similar queries into, into blobs. Like um, you see that this is a blob of statements, this is a blob of statements, and if you if, if, if you inspect these, then you see that all these are the statements which are using like the select statements for locking in users. These are page caches. This is all, all the statements um, doing some like user settings or something like this. So that, that makes sense. That, uh, well, that was just uh, for validation that uh, our approach wasn't that bad. You see that there are some isolated axes, and these are all the 40, 15 uh, artificial attacks. So these have not been related to any of the other attack groups, uh, uh, other SQL command groups, without one exception. Mm -hmm. So here we see that this is a SQL statement, and, but, and this is a modification of these statements, and this is, again, highly di diverse uh, uh, compared to the group of statements. So this is some some evidence that this uh, distance measure on trees is not a bad idea for, uh, for doing so. I'm still investigating on that. So um, basically that's it. So um, for as, a f as for a summary, um, we, uh, as take a home messages, my, my take, a home, home, uh, take, a take home messages, like uh, a successful SQL query needs to alter the statement which you already have in your database somehow. Um, the syntactical approach of uh, analyzing SQL, in, uh, SQL commands on the back end for detecting um, SQL injections is pretty promising because it escapes any evasion tex techniques an attacker might employ, uh, employ to, um, to evade your pattern detection. The vect vectorization of trees has been proven shown to be to show good results on machine learning, and still there's Room for room for improvement, especially on more inv more validation on real world applications, and um, yeah, the last statement is. Uh,
creating the parser, SQL parser for for um, SQL statement is like almost the hardest part of the whole project, or has been. So um, just some, if you're interested on some comments on that, and uh, like in theory, <laughs> parsing uh, SQL should be fairly easy. So there should be some, yeah, I, I will hit the five minutes, thanks. Uh, so in theory, there should be a grammar of your for your database, which s uh, defines all the valid statements of your database system. In practice, um, and you can use that grammar to create to ge automatically generate the code of code of the parser. In practice, um, creating the parser, like uh, doing the machine learning, is peanuts over over creating the parser. I had uh, had a look at uh, several um, statements, uh, several database systems. First, I uh, had a look at the My MySQL code. So my my first approach was, okay, there's open source databases. I can just use their parser. No. First, it doesn't use, uh, it doesn't really externalize, so you cannot easily access the parser. It is very tightly hidden deep into the MySQL database. Um, and it's not easy to um, to get the parser into creating a parse tree, so you cannot really easily create access the parse tree for anal analysis. And um, some, yeah, this is where you find the parser of um, MySQL. And who is using My MySQL? Anyone here? Who's using Postgres? If you have a look at these two files, you will switch to Postgres, I guess. <laughs> um, th the parser of MySQL was a big, big mess. I never, I will not use MySQL anymore because th I guess there's so much people fooling around with that code. So um, I also had a look at Postgres. And if you had just, I'm not a C programmer, I have to, I have to admit, I ju just do everything in Java. So it was kind of hard to read through all the SQL, uh, um, C code. But compared to MySQL, Postgres was like heaven. It was like almost a pure joy just walking through the code because it's well documented, <laughs> well structured, and it had a had really cool and clean design, documented and perfect. So that was uh, this, for me, this is just a far better choice. There's some uh, somewhat because I needed to have that in Java for uh, um, hooking up with my um, machine learning libraries. So um, I, need I was looki looking for some uh, parsing stuff in Java. There's an by in Ingress, they um, have created a SQL parser collection, which is a, to uh, a tool set for a lot of uh, different di dialects like Oracle and so on. There's uh, JS SQL parser. This is a project of, uh, of an Italian guy. I don't know the real name from uh, of. And um, basically what I did for, for these experiments, I uh, modifi modified the JSQL parser to do some more parsing than uh, the orig original has. And um, this is all uh, available on GitHub, so and also as well as the rest. So if you have any interest in running that code, just contact me, and that's all open source. So that's it. That's more, well, that was my presentation. And feel free to have any questions. <laughs> If you do, if you not do it right, then you can you are, you are effective to um, what's called second order SQL injections. So just imagine a store procedure using values of your database. So you s you you, st you start a SQL uh, uh, you create a store procedure which does do concatenate some of the values you have in your in some other table. So if an attacker is able to inject SQL commands into that other table, and your stored procedure is concatenating the values, you know, that could just lead to another SQL injection. And that's called um, um, second order SQL injection. So if you just, if you uh, manage to use like prepared statements to um, prevent the first case, then you're fine. So my, my, my approach would be to just 
have a look at every place where you just uh, where, where you use uh, SQL and just stick to prepared statement. No, but um, if the the cre uh, the stored procedure is using uh, is relying on, on on values you stored in the database and these have not been properly stored, then you're inf uh, you're infectable. Okay. Then thanks for attending, and if you have any more questions, just contact me afterwards.